that was, uh, that was a nice intro. I like that. Hello, and welcome to the Military Science Fiction panel for Science Fiction and Fantasy Con 2020. I am Josh Hayes, the moderator of this panel, and I'm joined by Jonathan Brzee, Rick Partlow, Dean M. Cole, and Amy J. Murphy. Welcome to everyone, and welcome to everybody in the live chat. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. Uh, I've got a couple of questions to kind of kick us off uh, and start the conversation going. If you're watching live, uh, go ahead and start leaving your comments in now or your questions in now and just kind of maybe write a question in capital letters so we can see what you're uh, what you're posting on. And then uh, later on in the show, we'll catch some of those live questions before we stop the panel. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm Josh Hayes. I'm the author of the Valor Trilogy. You can see some of the covers behind me. Uh, Jonathan Brzee is the author of the United Federation Marine Corps series, Rick Partlow's Drop Trooper series. Uh, Dean M. Cole is the author of uh, several, and uh, his military sci-fi is the Sector 64 series. And then Amy J. Murphy uh, has written the Allies and Enemy series. Um, all those are military sci-fi. And of course, the authors have written other books that are not that. Uh, but since we're specifically talking about mill sci-fi on this panel i wanted to highlight those series um so i wanted to kick it off uh just by talking about what first attracted you to this genre and then what keeps bringing you back and and re uh, in uh, re uh iterating the genre to make it new and fresh uh rick we'll start with you i have a military background my father was in world war ii um and he used to tell me stories about his experiences. We used to watch World War II movies together ad nauseum. And so the military came first, and then I started getting interested in science fiction. And uh, when I read Jerry Parnell as a teenager, it kind of all came together. Um, and military science fiction has been one of my favorite genres since then. And I first the first uh, novel I ever wrote intended for publication was military science fiction. Is that published now, or is that just a drawer that, novel? That's Duty on our planet. Oh, right on. Cool. Uh, Amy, what about you? Well, um, I have always been a fan of military science fiction, I, but I think even before that, I was brought up in a household that was very um, you know, military-based. My father was a United States Marine. Unfortunately, I am not a person that could serve. Um, I don't think anyone would want someone with my vision armed, uh, but um, I do have a deep ingrained respect for the service, and uh, I think it's kind of naturally to gravitate towards things that, to read and also view and movies and things, just that, that kind of uh, portray that. And um, I thought it was, therefore, it was a natural progression for me to write in that uh, in that uh, genre, um, it's, it, it felt like a natural fit for me, I would say. Okay, uh, Jonathan, what about you? Well, <clears throat> they say, write what you know. <laughs> and I spent four years in the Navy, then 30 years in the Marine Corps, retiring as a colonel, in which I was an infantry officer, um, combat vet. In fact, I wrote my first novel while deployed to Iraq, uh, but it was just straight military fiction. Um, and But my heart's always been in science fiction. Uh, my brother kind of got me started in it when I was a kid. And so uh, when I wrote my first military science fiction, which was Recruit, um, it kind of took off. And now I've got uh, 70, 78 titles right now. The bulk of them are military science fiction because that's what my readers keep asking me to write. Every, every once in a while, I'll go a little bit to the side to um, military paranormal. I just wrote a YA, but it's always when you're writing the next book in X series. Uh, Dean, what about you? Well, yeah, Jonathan took the words right out of my mouth. I was, you know, what they say, write what you know. And um, I, I was a military guy. I was in, started off in the Army well, a long time ago and um, started off enlisted and then Got into Warrant Officer Flight School, flew Apaches, and um, and just I, most of mine have an aviation tie-in. But uh, I just I always love the genre, and I love the the human struggle it represents, and so it's something that just that I couldn't help myself. <laughs> 
Uh, I think I have to agree with everybody. Um, I, my dad, my whole family uh, it has a military history. My grandfather fought at uh, Normandy in World War II, and my dad uh, was in. Uh, my dad actually served in all three branches. Well, all three three branches. He started in the Navy, went to the Air Force, and then ended up in the Army as a chaplain. Uh, did 33 years, and then I joined the Air Force uh, and did some time there. And, uh, I just, I, I'm. What brings me to the genre is really the. Uh, the brotherhood aspect of really like it, it really to me it doesn't matter what's happening in the book uh as f um more than um how the characters are interact are, are becoming closer to each other because of what's going on around them like i think like that is one of the things that um when you look at military throughout the ages it, it doesn't really matter who they're fighting or why they're fighting really what it boils down to is the person they're fighting with um and uh, that I think, uh, above all else, is why I like the genre. Um, I like diving into that aspect of it more than anything. Um, so we talked about what what kind of brought us to the genre. Um, what do you think? I mean, all of us have kind of written uh, some really good selling series, and I think that we can bring um, a a a plethora of different styles. But what do you think overall? Is, what do you think readers? Uh, coming to the genre, expect from a a well written mill sci fi. Uh, Dean, let's start with you this time. Well, um, they want you to know what you're writing about. They want you to know. Um, they want to see recognizable organizational structures. For instance, they want you to know your the tropes of the of it. Uh, uh, people take actually like to see that it, as, as long as you do something original with it. You don't want to come up and just do the same cookie cutter thing, but um, and and entertain them, but whatever you do, don't uh, don't get something backwards or wrong. Put a safety on a Glock or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one hundred percent. Amy, what about you? Um, I would have to say uh, my take would be it would have more to do with how they connect for the individual or the protagonist in the story and how they identify with themselves and uh, how they would identify the struggles that this character is, is undergoing as well and have that ability to um, move forward with them. I know it sounds like a very generic, very broad thing, um, but add to that, that framework of the person as they work within their environment, that teamwork, um, having that uh, element of self-sacrifice and dedication to purpose, I think, uh, military sci-fi kind it makes it it lends itself to that and makes sense for you you have a character like that you know rather if you have a regular character who's not in a story that's generally considered a military sci-fi it's that much harder to demonstrate how that person is meant to work in their environment if that makes any sense sure absolutely uh rick what about you well, I, I get the most uh, comments from people talking about the, the feel of being in the military, the, uh, the atmosphere, the, uh, the way people talk to each other, you know, the, the way re you react to things, the sort of the humor that goes on, just the, the general atmosphere of readers who've been in the military recognize of being in the military. They, they want that atmosphere except in a strange place. They want, they want to know that, I think they want to know that, that some things are never going to change no matter where we are, that, uh, you know, a soldier is always going to be a soldier. A Marine's always going to be a Marine, whether they're here on earth in Iraq or, you know, in Alpha, on the third planet out from Alpha Centauri A. They're always going to be uh, prescribed Motrin 800. And, yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're always in the process of going paperless. Which is, uh, which is just <laughs> the same as taking for non-prescription Motrin. That's right. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, what about you? I've, I tried to experiment with a few books, you know, breaking the tropes, going outside the boundaries. Those were a mistake. Um, people expect the military, at least the protagonists, <clears throat> you know, your MCs, to be the good guys, uh, where discipline, honor, and loyalty are going to carry the day. Um, and I could probably sum it up on a review I had for one of my books where the review basically was, I don't read a Jonathan Brazy book 
to, to have the Marines the bad guys. And I think that sums it up pretty well. And like I said, I tried a few times to see which direction I could go. Eh, no more. Well, it's interesting to say that, uh, Dean, you mentioned the tropes, uh, earlier and Rick, you talked about the atmosphere and you mentioned humor. Um, those are kind of things you see. Um, the humor aspect isn't, isn't something you, a reader may think of automatically when they think of mill sci-fi and they think that this is going to be action and there's going to be explosions and gun battles and stuff, but you, uh, humor is a very big part of, and it's the dark humor. Sometimes that's a very, oh, exactly. part yeah. Of, you know, almost all the vast majority in real life anyway oh yeah 100 percent. and i think you know and and you see that too in in uh, in law enforcement uh where you have that kind of gallows humor because you uh, want to see a great example of that generation kill it's full of that um, the experiences of the guy who's embedded with the marines and right that, that humor is spot on that's exactly what it's like and Actually, to that end, you know, you're talking about the darker humor or gallows humor. I mean, any sort of industry that's like even a, a first responder sort of attitude. And I'm thinking specifically a, a nurse. I'm a nurse. I'm a critical care nurse. And it's a very interesting time to be alive right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, or to be a nurse, I should say. And um, there is a lot of that that goes on because you all get each other, you know, and mm -hmm. you're going to you're going to make a joke amongst other nurses or other first responders or other people that work in emergency situations that somebody else, a stranger on the street that works in a bank would be absolutely aghast at, you know, so it's definitely a, a, a portion of that. I was a um, volunteer EMT outside of Washington, DC. And that was before I'd ever been in combat or anything. I was a Lieutenant captain, just made me captain. And uh, the first, the first death that I came upon, I was just, I was shocked at the cops at their as we're trying to carry this body up from a basement at the black humor. Yeah. At that point, you know, because I had been a peacetime marine at Camp Lejeune and went off in recon in, 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 in Japan, I never really come across it. But then after 30 years, it's part of me, too. Well, and you kind of, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I was a cop for 10 years and I, and I tried to explain a lot, you know, some people would, would question, well, why are you, well, you know, how do you, how do you do this? And, and how, how do you deal with the people that are acting, you know, certain ways? And I said, well, every day for me, I'm meeting someone on their worst day. And, um, but that's every day for me. And I think yeah. that um, you, you, you know, you get to a point, like you say, your first, your first, death is it's shocking but but after that the the shock kind of it 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 goes a little it goes down every time and you kind of get desensitized to everything around you and um and so it, it's interesting because as as first responders or, or or military or whoever um you go through these events and you get desensitized to them uh and then you do bring that dark humor and you bring that into the into the book and i'm wondering uh are there specific ways in your own writing as you're doing this where you try to hit the reader emotionally by by showing them this type of of event and hoping that you get that emotional reaction where they're not desensitized as you are to it but how how do you how do you work that into your books anybody have an idea about that I use it a lot with the reaction of the people around and the reaction of my uh, in, in most of my books at least were yeah, most of my MCs, um, the first time that they come across or the first time they kill somebody, uh, I, I try to recreate some of the feelings that I had to remind people that this isn't just, well, it is just electrons because it's all fiction, but to put people in that situation. And uh, in fact, all of my MCs, except for one who was a little bit, socially different, although she's one of my most popular characters. Um, I, I try to bring that particularly into the first kill, uh, just to kind of set the stage. I would think that um, having a character as your main character who, who, you know, like just to relate back to is for somebody else you're meeting, the, uh, that's the worst day of their life, the person you've just killed or the person you're, that you're combat. that's the worst day of their life. But for that, your main character, it's Tuesday, right? This is something that happens to them every day. And that, dis 
that disparity, that significant difference is the best way to, to make it a, an, an impactful or emotional or a memorable thing for your reader because just how this person reacts to it or doesn't react to it or even jokes about it versus how them as they're, they're the bystander in watching this, this whatever violent activity or whatever it is, their reaction to it at seeing how the main character is not reacting to it is a significant way of showing it as well. Just the actual being of that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that uh, on the flip side of that too, um, to give the reader a negative experience is, is how much you build up the character that you are going to kill, like eventually, right? And how about how much you build that relationship between the two characters, and then you have the reader connecting with that character, and then when you when you do kill them, uh, having that that gut wrenching moment of oh, I love that character, and now they're gone. And uh, yeah. I did that in one of my books, uh, Strikers War, and, and like the number one. Com a compliment I get on that book is that when they get to the end, they cry. And I'm like, yes, I want your tears. Keep crying. <laughs> Sometimes I've had to go back when I, when it makes sense that a character is killed. And then I've actually gone back and built up their relationship in the rewrite. Yeah. Uh, just because I hadn't planned for them to die before, but you know, books write themselves mm. and, and it really has to happen. Well, I want to make it a little bit more emotional. So I go back and, and, and build up the character a little bit more. I like how we went full Joss Whedon and just went, oh, who we're going to just straight to death, straight yeah. to character death, full <laughs> Joss Whedon right away. <laughs> nothing in between. People expect really, I mean, you can't really have a, a, a war story if nobody, none of your main characters die because that's true. Die in war. And, and the people yeah. who read this expect someone close to the story to die because they don't want to go all red wedding on them. That's right. <laughs> I mean, you have to make. I, I try to make it in at least in my books. I try to make the deaths meaningful because I know not all deaths are meaningful because people just die like that for no reason at all. Yeah. But for a for a important character who's important to the to the main character, I try to make it meaningful so it doesn't doesn't feel cheap to the readers. Uh, so we talked about some things that. Um, the readers kind of expect and what we like to include. Um, what do you think uh, as an author coming into this genre uh, for the first time, um, what are the things that you think that they should not do? Like number one thing a writer should not do coming into this genre. Um, I would say it's kind of funny, but don't try to copy everybody else. And also don't try to be too original. It sounds it sounds weird, but <laughs> readers, readers want to read the same thing except different. They want they want to read familiar situations and your fresh take on them. So I would not try to be incredibly different to the point where people can't identify with the situation anymore, because a lot of what people want is to be able to identify, even in a future setting, with the situation, the characters. So you have to keep it, keep it familiar to them, but don't try to copy, uh, you know, copy Heinlein's Starship Troopers or copy Ringo, you know, because you're not going to be able to do it. You want to get the the atmosphere, the feeling of those, but not, not do like a beat for beat. Right. Yeah. Um, One thing that I that I found is, if you're basing your story on, essentially basing it on on the military now and in just in a different area. I mean, and you're not doing some experimental thing that's totally, you know, aliens who, you know, your MC is an alien that's not even close to being human, is don't break the norms of today. Um, I remember talking to Marco Cluse. the future. In the yeah, what, I was talking with Marco Cluse about one of his books where he dared, now we're talking, you know, 3,000 years in the future, 2,000 years in the future, whatever, but he dared to have the his space marines, the officers had Navy ranks, mm. and the enlisted had Marine Corps ranks. So he had a lieutenant commander and a, and a gunny. And he got castigated for that. <laughs> you can't do that. You know, needless to say that the rank of Marine Corps gunnery sergeant wasn't even, didn't even exist until 1958. 
but that doesn't make any difference. How <laughs> dare you mess this up? You're being inaccurate. And I even made clear in, in my drop trooper books that the Marine organization was kind of a combination of old Marine and special forces and airborne troops, but it didn't matter. It's like, this isn't the, this isn't how yeah. you say it. <laughs> and it, it's, it's almost, I, I keep saying that our readers are almost to the same degree as Regency romance. Yeah. You know, Regency romance, if you have a certain kind of collar, oh, that yeah. five years out of date, those <laughs> authors are going to hear it. They will, fi they will find where you live. <laughs> That's yeah. right. And yeah. the thing yeah. is, you got to be careful. Our readers expect certain things, real, it, uh, as yeah. Dave was saying, the tropes that are there, our readers expect certain things. And, and if you, as a writer, go beyond that, you better do a really good job in explaining it and as a writer in order to bring them along. Right. Because anything you do that's outside of their expectations is going to yank them right out of the story. And that's that's yeah. the prime thing you don't ever want to do with a reader. You want to challenge them. You want to make them think. You want to do all that. But you don't want to have them suddenly suspend disbelief and suddenly be out of the story because of something you get backwards or. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, there was a book I read uh, a couple of years ago um, where you're talking about getting pulled out of the story where it was a it was a Navy ship. Uh, well, it was a starship, but it was Navy ranks. Right. And um, one of the, the techs who was technically a, a rating or an enlisted was like basically arguing with the captain like um, during some type of it was building up to be a combat. Uh, scene, um, but they hadn't started fighting yet, and the the enlisted or the rating was arguing with the captain on whether or not they should do this or they could do that, and that that right there is is probably my my number one issue with with people that write mill sci fi is that in in a military structure there is no there is no arguing with the captain, especially if it's the captain of a warship and, and you're enlisted. Um, I, I read one where a uh a PFC was basically running the battle and a major was calling him, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, what people, that will, sir? people will believe the impossible. I, 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 mean, I try yeah. to read through every book. I did not get through that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People yeah. will believe the impossible with try to get them to believe the implausible and you're in trouble. I mean, we can have a whole ship sailing through the air yeah, that's good. 10 feet over downtown but if you do, like, if you mess that part up, yeah. they're not going to believe it. Right. Cross the line. You've crossed the line. I'm sorry, but no, no. You can have, you can have all, all the artificial gravity you want. I'm sorry, but no, you have crossed the line. You know. So, so go faster than light, but a private's not going to get called sir by a major. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is the impossible. I, I would more likely believe faster than light travel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, a a Amy, it sounded like you wanted to say something. Oh, no, I was just, just saying, like, as far as that suspension of, you know, um, disbelief or uh, suspension of belief or whatever, uh, the other thing is uh, you have the, the character that can withstand anything and get up. Like, they've got, they've got that John Wick, Jason Bourne syndrome. They've been yeah. injured through the gut, but they stand up and they run around. And everyone's like, oh, it's adrenaline. Adrenaline, you, you've got if your gut bullet wound or something like that, or if you've been stabbed in the gut or something like that, or your leg has a, a grievous injury, but you're still fighting and uh, you just work through that pain. And uh, that, if per, especially a person that like maybe knows a little bit more than when people get injured, how they respond to it, you know, th those are things too. And then there's the emotional impact as well. If you've just seen a, a best friend and comrade fall, you know, how you react to it right. um, and those emotional implications and the cumulative emotional uh, impact of being in battle and being in warfare and, you know, a realistic disposition and how PTSD works. Um, those are really good ways to, you know, add credibility is if you pay attention to that as, as an author. I, I had a lot of my readers reach out to me when I had a very major character for four of the books, I guess. It was the, the original main characters, Lieutenant, Captain, and on up. Um, and I had him commit suicide with PTSD. Mm. Oh. And I, I just kind of said, you know, I, I put some realism, but I didn't realize how many people 
reacted to that yeah. in a positive manner. And they had discussions and all this kind of stuff. Um, those are the things that you can, that are very realistic that are too often ignored. Like you're saying, you know, you get shot in the gut and also, and you're still running around the battlefield and stuff like that. Um, but those are things I think that add a little bit more verisimilitude to your writing. And, and that's what gets people to say, ah, this writer has been there. I think too, when, once you start kind of, like you have the, the the very surface layer of things that you need to get right, but then you get down into kind of the weeds of, you know, PTSD specifically. That you you really have to be careful about how you approach that and and how purposeful you're doing it. I I, I touched on it a little bit in, one, in my second Valor book, where the main character has a little bit of PTSD from an incident that happened in the first book, and I was very cognizant of. Uh, a going overboard with it and making it kind of a uh, a caricature caricature of of PTSD. Um, you know, it, you have the people that complained. Uh, you know, I don't want to ruin anybody's Avengers Endgame spoilers, but uh, you had a lot of people that complained about Thor's PTSD and how he dealt with that and how they made it very comical. Um, and on one side of the, the fence, I would say yes, that's true. But on the other side, people experience PTSD in very different ways. So, him becoming that way and becoming kind of non-caring about everything, there there are some people that experience PTSD in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that when you get into those deep subjects, you really need to kind of do your research on on what you're writing about. Yeah. Um, and that kind of carries into the next question, but really quick, I want to mention too, there's a lot of people that joined uh, after I mentioned it before. If you have a question or a comment that you want us to touch uh, on here in a little while, uh, make sure you put it in the live chat there with either a question or a comment tag on it, uh, and we'll get to it when we get to that part of the panel. Um, research. Uh, you know, a couple of us have been in the military, a couple of us are, are first responders or, or in critical care. What do you do for research as you're, you're going through, uh, and writing your books? I know that I, I read, um, uh, I call them bio novels or autobiographies, uh, from, uh, uh, like Chris Kyle's book. I'm reading, uh, Sergeant, uh, Belaver, uh, Belaver. Olavia. Olavia. Yeah. Yep, I'm reading his book right now. Sorry, um, and there's a lot of good other nonfiction books that you can write. Like Tom Clancy did a lot of nonfiction books. Um, but what do you guys do for your research on your novels specifically, Amy? Let's start with you. Well, I, I I think the best thing is is to ask someone who actually knows. Ask so ask someone who has actually been there. I, that's how I learn. You know, I, if I find something interesting, and if there's a fact or a tidbit, or I learn some sort of um, historical trivia. Uh, of a bit of military, I, I look into it, um, I'll research it, and um, and then I, I phone a friend, so to speak. You know, I, I have um, a friend that works with members of the armed forces um, as a um, as a counselor, and uh, you know, I kind of get her intake, or her her take on on how uh, people would react and things like that, and it kind of humanizes certain things to it. Um, but if it's if facts. Um, there's no shortage of information out there on the World Wide Web if you're going to Google something. But if you're going to Google something, you got to know that the source is the appropriate thing. Um, and then um, run it up against somebody that could actually tell you the truth and how that relates with whatever it is, be it like a term about ranking or um, how something would work in terms of functionality within a team or, you know, any other thing that... Uh, I run into that would hamper the plot or cause I don't certainly don't want to, to disrespect uh, the reader's expectations for what I'm trying to show them. And I have a, a little bit of a heavier burden to carry because not unfortunately being able to serve. I, I, I want to um, do it the proper service and the proper honor of, of getting it right. It says research and research and research. Uh, Dean, what about you? Um, start off with the internet and I go to the internet and then to the internet. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, also, you know, family and friends who you know, have even more recent experience than me. My son-in-law was a sniper in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Um, I'll reach out to him at, um, at times, ask him, you know, certain things and try not to pry too much because he, he's definitely had his, it, any of us who've been in it 
Um, he obviously was in it a lot more than me, you, Jonathan, as well. But it's not something you really talk about. And, and, and sometimes when you start to go into those things and start to extract, I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent now, but you just, I don't want to dig too deep because when you tell a story, you, reli you relive it at a certain level. So anyway, sorry. No, that's good. Yeah. Jonathan? I do a lot of research. Um, one of the things that I tend to do in my books is to bring in history. Uh, a lot of my characters are history buffs. So I bring in different things, and I like giving the back traditions of, of the militaries and backgrounds and what people did at different times, you know, whether it's the, the cadets jumping off of the Chapultepec uh, during the, they're in the Mexican American war, things like that. And I also mine, well, a lot of it, I mine from things that either I saw or people have told me, but I, I, I watched discovery channel military and oh, you can yeah. get a lot of good little stories there yeah. that go in that you could expand. I would say 90% of every action that I've written, I don't, you know, whether it's fighting against giant grub like aliens based on reality. Um, sometimes I've had to reach out to people to make sure because it was too close. Uh, there was a, a, a big sniper battle in Ramadi. Um, and I reached out, even though Ramadi was a Marine area, this was an army sniper. And I reached out to him to give me a little bit more clarity on what happened. But one of the things, oh, and for anybody who's never been in the military and you want to start writing your military sci-fi, the first thing you do is you watch Saving Private Ryan. Hmm. In my opinion, that gives you a feel of what combat is like, particularly the initial attack over the over the beach, which I'm glad I never had to do. But there's also a second thing to do. And I think it might have been Amy that I told this to. Uh, if you want to get a feel and you want to get some of these stories, you walk down to your local American Legion or VFW post on a Friday night and offer to buy a beer and you won't get out of there without <laughs> a hundred stories because yeah. these guys in, inside the Vietnam, they don't talk to you that much necessarily out when you meet them on the street or whatever else. But in the VFW post, it's like they, it's like they're protected yeah. and they're surrounded by everybody else. And, and I did tell one, one young lady to do this, uh, an aspiring writer. Okay. She was an attractive woman of about, you know, early twenties. She emailed me later and said that she didn't leave there until two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> she bought one drink, and then everybody just crowded around and gave her every story from Korea <laughs> through Vietnam and Iraq and everything else. And she said she had more there to be able to write a series. Hmm. Wow, that's a really good idea. Well, I have to as as a nurse, I've. You know, I've had the privilege of uh, caring for veterans and some of our older veterans, and it's usually this, this elderly gentleman with his hat. They've got their hat. They've got their hat where they served and everything. Just yes, just like the hat. And I'm like, oh, you know, and that is always a door opener. I was like, oh, thank you for your service. And sometimes they'll, they'll tell me, you know, they'll tell me a story. And I have, I'm there's this one story I'm sitting on that is just an incredible story. It's like something that it would be in a movie and it's very cinematic and I can envision it, but it is very true. That is very true. I can tell you, you can a lot of great stories if they feel comfortable in speaking with you about what they've experienced. And, and I think, you know, kind of, I'm in that situation with them providing care and they feel like they can open up to me that, and it feels like a safe environment, a safe space for them to speak. Yes. Absolutely, I could totally agree with that. <laughs> I um, I have a lot of resources in my family and, and close friends who got combat experience. So I draw from them and, and Google like Dean. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can find a lot of stuff. You can find YouTube. You can find uh, a lot of you know documentary sources on YouTube. But Bloggers. I, I like to say the one thing I tried not to do, and I this is just for me. It's it's my approach is I try not to take too much uh, historical battle experiences into the story because I feel like that some things are going to be different depending on the kind of war you're fighting. And a lot of, a lot of what I'm writing 
it's a different kind of war. So I tend to draw not from like infantry experiences or I, I try to like kind of coalesce it into the, the feeling of it, but in a new, like for, for instance, in drop trooper, they're in powered armor and they're, they're fighting together, but a lot of it, they're inside their own head and, and for a lot, a lot of it, they can't talk to anybody even. And they're, they're working off data from sensors, but they're making decisions inside their own head and not as much being, uh, it's like part of it, not part of an infantry unit. It's, it's more, it's almost a tank battle, except if your radios didn't work. And I, I try to, I try to work, uh, a kind of a difference in there so that people will get the feel of a military battle, but not the exact feel of like a world war two battle or Vietnam. But I, but I did have a lot of sources on Vietnam and I, I drew heavily on that for, uh, experiences. Uh, when I was in ROTC in college, my, uh, the cadre at my ROTC was full of sergeants who fought in Vietnam. One of them was on hamburger Hill with the 101st. Uh, they, 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 uh, Gave me a lot of sources back then that I didn't even need, know I would need later on. I should I should clear up something though on my on what I said. Um, like in my fire ant series, they're 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 fighter pilots in space fighters. Obviously, it's not going to have much to do with infantry. But what but what I'm pulling out of the military are the little sometimes it's the hijinks you do to each other. You know, they all put the balloon. I mean, the bucket of water. You know, on the hat. yeah, yeah, that's simplistic, but that that type of thing, and it's those things. In fact, when you go to the VFW, they'll usually tell you more of those things, like the time that the mortar round hit the outhouse, and there was a lieutenant sitting there on the can wondering oh, what had happened. Yeah. What the stories are going to tell you? And these are the things that go cross. I mean, the Roman, the Babylonian soldiers were doing that to each other. You know, so I think these things are going to be going on for the next how many thousands of years. And these are the things that give you the verisimilitude, I think, that bring the people who've served in the military going, oh, yeah, that's right. I, I understand that. Yeah, but obviously when you're, you, you know, Rick, you're absolutely right. You know, I can't take my, my infantry experience very well and write about a fighter pilot. Of course, I can send it to Rick Kennedy, uh, Chris Kennedy, and a couple of my academy classmates who are fighter pilots to give me a little bit more of the feel of that. But it's these little things that aren't really military. It could be, I, ma I imagine the police forces do the same kind of thing. I'm re-watching The Wire right now. Oh, they, uh, and they're doing that. Uh, Actually, The Wire is probably out of all the, this is kind of a, a, a rabbit trail, but out of all the police shows that have ever been produced, The Wire is probably the closest to how it actually happens in real life police work. And, and that's my, I mean, I haven't watched The Wire for 15 years now. I'm just starting the fi season five again. I watched, the, I watched the last one for season four last night. That's my impression. I, I get a feel of that's what a police department really could be. I wanted to touch on really quick before we get to the live uh, questions, uh, since we are talking about mill sci-fi, um, we've talked a lot about how to make it um, uh what the genre readers expect. But when we talk about the sci-fi part of the military, um, what's something that you guys have used in your own work to give it that sci-fi flair that gives it a little bit more of just a military book? Uh, Dean, do you want to go first on this one? Um, I guess, uh, well, obviously you get, you get into the space aspect of it, introducing um, uh, new technologies and or, or new ways to use old technologies, incorporating um, uh, naval type warfare into a space um, situ uh, scenario, space battle. Um, and one thing I, you got to be real careful about is as far as the sci-fi portion of it goes, is there's, there's almost all science fiction, almost all science fiction is has a military aspect to it. Usually there's, you know, most of it, you're, you're going to have a conflict with some type of alien or something like that, or it's going to be in space and there's going to be conflict and phasers and all that. But there's militaristic sci-fi like Star Trek is not military sci-fi. It's militaristic sci-fi. Right. Uh, military sci-fi, strict military sci-fi does all the things we talked about. Um, it takes today's organizational structures typically in moves them into the future or into a futuristic situation. And so um, 
anyway, it's all that somebody else <laughs> Amy, what do you think? Um, I, I, the thing that popped to mind was that uh, line from Firefly, we live on a spaceship, dear. But <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, yes. Or how can we make this more sci-fi? Put the word quantum in front of everything. No it, it is. I mean, it's a very accurate way that, you know, like how Dean described it is just that you take that existing structure and you're moving it into a future era and every, and, and how that's how and that's the setting of uh, where your story is and in essence in really good military science fi sci-fi that element is an additional character that doesn't talk mm. it's another character in in that it's how it affects everything every decision it frames uh, the plot developments and how things move forward uh, for instance i mean you're on a spaceship where the environment that you live in um, on a spaceship, let's say, everything outside the ship always wants to kill you. It's space, <laughs> you know, so that's an additional stressor. That's a structure. That's a that's this murderous, unspoken character is always surrounding you. So it it kind of adds that and enriches and enriches it as well. I mean, you probably all make the same argument for you know people that you know write submarine books now you know because the, the water is always going to be there as present too so that's what I, I that's what comes to mind for me rick or jonathan um well what amy said is true about the space part of it that's something you have to take into account is the uh, the added deadly i mean you can't your if your ship gets disabled or you know unpowered you can't Build a raft and, it's, and paddle the safety. You know you're dead. You're uh, probably millions of kilometers from help. You know, and and during a battle, no one can afford to send somebody out to get you anyway. So that's part of it. Also, I think part of it that you have to kind of control the science fiction part is the dehumanization factor, because the way things are moving now. With military technology, everything's going to drones that you control from, you know, and and not just the ones we fly now from, uh, you know, with like the the missile drones. They're building drones that you know with machine guns that walk on four legs and you control remotely. And maybe that's the future, but I don't think that's what people want to read about. Right. So you you have to. That's something you have to come up. I had to come up with reasons why this wasn't going to work in this war, why you couldn't do it. And I think it's important to try to keep a lid on that kind of technology in military science fiction, or else you're writing about video gamers from, you know, right. 10,000 yeah. kilometers away controlling a drum. You want, people don't want to read that. They want to read about in the game. Yeah. So that's, that's something you have to put in there. You have to not just include the technology, but give a reason why, this isn't going to work. Like in a couple of mine, it's we've had experiences where remotely piloted drones were hacked and attacked us and nobody trusted. And they tried using autonomous ones and those kind of went nuts. Rogue AI killed, or something. They, they, they killed their own people. So people don't trust anything except a human being with their finger on the trigger. And that's something you have to take into account. I want to try to get to a few questions here before we you know, we're getting really close to having at the, the end of the show here. Um, the first question I found is from uh, Jim Dean, who asks, uh, "Which is closer to quintessential mill sci-fi: gritty pew pew or strategic strategy and tactics?" For I'm military sure. strategy, yeah. strategy and tactics, uh, pew pew is space opera, in my opinion. Oh. Uh, well, gritty. When he said that, I guess I keyed on the gritty part because yeah, the gritty too. part is like showing a private starting off in boot camp and working all the way through. To me, like something like that, like a uh, Red Rising or um, um, Red. Uh, I can't remember the name of the other one I was going to quote, but something that shows that character development and sees them go through. That's a quintessential military sci-fi to me. There is still obviously military sci-fi where you jump right in the action with people who've already been developed already yeah. in there. So, yeah, I would say the gritty pew pew really, uh, for me, that's what I write mostly. I mean, the strategy and tactics are more like a top down view of the, of the war. And 
I think a lot of David Weber esque uh, strategy. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. People like that, but a lot the people that I'm trying to reach, they want you know they want the the private or the sergeant on the ground getting shot at. You know, yeah. I mean it's a big enough sandbox where you can get both any number of voices or all across the spectrum there. But I think there's room for all those tastes in there as well. But I lean definitely more towards the gritty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, the next question is um, from Scott McGlasson, who asks, "What's going stale in mill sci-fi?" Any opinion? I think if you write it well, it, nothing goes stale. It's it's when you write it flat and just count on the trope attracting people that it's flat. You have to you have to make good characters and good writing, no matter what. Wait, Maybe zombies is the, is the largest yeah. subgenre within sci-fi, and in many ways, I do kind of compare it to romance. Um, there's not much going stale in romance; it just depends on how well you write it. The presentation. All this, I mean, this the same story has been told over and over again. It's just how you present it. You yeah. know, I, I, I've I've had people ask me. They say. Oh, I've got this great story I want to write. I don't want to tell you what it is because I don't want anyone to steal it. I'm like, <laughs> I bet you cool. I already know your story. You know, <laughs> I know the broad strokes of it. And it's it's not so much as as that of what particular thing is, it's just how you're telling it. And maybe that's the part what they mean is going stale. It's like how you're telling it is a different, you know, versus you know, something that's original or what what have you. Agreed. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to find a couple other ones in there in here. Con Contra Tempo asks, what are your fingernails on the chalkboard issues when you read others' stories? Calling a major, sir. Uh, <laughs> yeah, major. I just going to no. say that. You beat me, Dean. <laughs> the the private. Me, Dean. Oh, Call the private, private sir. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I, think, I think for me, a lot of it is people who don't take into account the effect of the technology they've introduced, and they try to keep everything you know, like, you know, 21st, early 21st century experience and they don't take into account, well, yeah, but we, you have, you introduce anti-gravity technology. Why would they be doing this? You know, why would they be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You got to really think through those. That's what the hardest part of writing this is, is writing out your outline because you have to consider every loophole that's going to, that any new technology you introduce is going yeah. to create potentially a plot hole that suddenly doesn't make sense because you created this and they're doing it, doing it another way that doesn't take advantage of that technology or completely forgets about it. One of the things that, and, and I, I've seen it a couple times commented in here. Um, um, uh, and, and the, the gist of it is there is a difference between military sci-fi and sci-fi that has military in it. Um, I, I think, and like you've mentioned too, that and, and Lisa mentioned in the comments, there's, you know, you have a space fleet battles and then you have space Marines. Um, but then you also have a lot of sci-fi that has military elements in it. Um, yeah. and, but I think when we're talking specifically mill sci-fi, it's, it's taking that military experience at its core and then adding in the sci-fi on top of it is kind of window dressing what's going on. Um, and in that, in that you're not really exploring the science fiction elements. It's just the, that's how the story is told, but you're not like in space opera, you're exploring like cool technologies or, or a different aliens or whatever. The aliens are just the enemy in mill sci-fi. You're not really exploring that technical aspect of the story. Do you guys agree or disagree? I like to, oh, I like yeah. to introduce a little space opera into my mill sci-fi just to, cause yeah. you, you can't have blank faced enemies, you know, even, right. Yeah. The enemy, the enemy has a, has a backstory in real they life. They have to have a reason why they're doing what they're doing, not just because we're bad guys. You right. Know? Right. I did it. You know, I had one of my series. I purposely made the enemy. They're they're a completely different creature. I mean, thinking and everything else, and and the humans never really quite understood them. All they knew is they had to fight them. And some of the reviews that I got, you know, the reviews were. were this was a very well accepted series of mine, but I did have reviews saying, well, who, who are they? Why, you know, they're just faceless. Mm. So I kind of did yeah. it. As, I did it on purpose, but then you have to think of what your readers are going to think. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't know that I, I, if I missed a question, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm, I'm scrolling through and, uh, 
looking at the live chat and we've got a lot of uh, conversation going on in live chat. So thank you guys for participating in that aspect of the panel. Um, I think maybe uh, if we could all just, um, what is one book specifically mill sci-fi book that you guys have read that, um, that you would recommend to someone first reading the genre. If, if a reader was coming to this genre and thinking what, what book would you recommend to, to get them in that genre and, and keep them there? Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers. Oh. Not oh. That I've ever actually read that book all the way through. <laughs> I'm, I'm like the outlier who's never read it all the way through. Like for me, it's forever war forever. Uh, John Holderman. Yeah. 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 For me, it'd be Pierce Brown's red rising. Um, well, it was a trilogy. Now he's added a couple more books to it, but um, it's not. Really it's, well it's almost a mix between uh, military sci-fi and space opera, but it's it's outstanding. Yeah, Amy, you said I didn't hear what you said. Would I receive any threats if I said something like Scalzi, like Old Man's War? I was. Oh, I, I, I love Old Man. For me, it's between Forever <laughs> War and Old Man's War. That was incredible. I was just gonna say that. Because I I, I, th I think he's the one that had the aliens that have to go through some sort of three day ceremony to get ready for the battle, and if you go up and kill them in the middle of the ceremony, they just start all over again. So they learn just to wait the three days and stuff, and just like okay, they got to do all this and they got to force field and all this stuff. I love stuff like that. Um, actually, I have a thought, and I don't. We haven't really brought you know. We talk about our traditional uh, like branches of the military, you know, the Marines and the Air Force. Space Force. We've I got a Space book. Force now. Yeah. And I tell you, I know it's real because when I, I just moved to Colorado Springs and when I went over to the exchange at, at the commissary at, at Peterson Air Force Base, there was a four-star parking space for the commander of Space, space Force. Force command. If the parking wow. space is there, yeah. it's real. I actually am <laughs> writing that takes place in the near future, like 15 or 20 years from now. The Space Force is a part of it. I'd yeah. never considered using it. Like how many things have to, you know, like we have to like retcon all these things now. We've got a Space right. Force and it's like, you know, well, why would you call them the Space Marines when you've got the Space Force, you know? It's Except the for the Space Force, the the soldiers are right down the, looking right down now the hill at Fort Carson. They're, <laughs> they come out of Fort Carson. They're soldiers, Army soldiers. Nice. I, my, I think... Uh, Going back to the book, I, I think my mind would be uh, on Basilisk Station by uh, David Weber. I love that book. Um, and then the first like eight of that series. And then after that, it kind of, but the first eight really good. Um, what's interesting about the fa Space Force is when I was in the Air Force, I was uh, assigned to Space Command. And so when that whole Space Force thing came out, uh, I took a picture of my my badge and said, look, I was Space Force before Space Force was cool. <laughs> Space Command is still... Uh, Space Command is still a command, though. It is still a command. Yep. And they're uh, well, right up. I, I live on Cheyenne Mountain, so they're right. Oh yeah, right, right next to Stargate. Right there. Right, up, right, yeah. right next to Stargate. That's right. <laughs> Uh, well, it is time to wrap up now, so I will uh, like to say thank you to our panelists for coming and hanging out with us today, and then everybody in the, the live chat that was participating and asked questions. Uh, thank you all for joining, and it, uh, I thought it was a good conversation. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think James is going to take over here pretty soon and, and wrap us up, but I'm not sure at, at what point in time that that happens. <laughs>